Did you know that the whole story of hate and racism actually started with this book? It started with the story of Noah and the Ark. I'm not joking, by the way. It all began in Genesis 9. The Bible claims that the prophet Noah was sleeping naked and drunk in his tent. He had three sons, Sam, Ham, and Yafeth. When Noah was sleeping naked and drunk, Sam and Yafeth turned their faces away and didn't look at him. However, the third son, Ham, apparently did a very, very bad thing to his naked sleeping father. Again, I'm not joking, it's all in Genesis 9. What Ham did to his naked father was really bad, to the extent that when Noah woke up and knew what Ham did to him, he cursed the children of Ham until the day of judgment. All the offspring of Ham are cursed forever, and they will be slaves to the offspring of Sam. If you are paying attention, Noah didn't curse his son who did the awful thing to him. No. Instead, he cursed all of his offspring, his son Canaan and his brothers and their descendants, and decided that all of them should be slaves to Sam and his descendants forever. Wait. Before I continue. When I was reading Genesis 9, I had several questions. I hoped that our Christian or Jewish friends could answer them for us. Number one. What did Ham do exactly to his father when he was sleeping naked? And number two, why didn't Noah curse his son himself? As he was the one who made the mistake, right? Why curse all of his offspring forever? Number three, if they are cursed forever and will be slaves forever, why should they be slaves to Sam's children specifically? What about the other son? Why wouldn't they be slaves to Sam and Yefith? together. Why only Sam? Number four, how do you think that makes me feel as a son of Ham myself? How should I love someone who believes that his God decided that I should be his slave? And number five, what about my Christian neighbors down the street who are also the son of Ham? Should they also be slaves to Sam or does that only apply to people? who doesn't believe in this nonsense. We need to answer all of these questions. And then we need to show that this was the beginning of racism that spread all over the world. And how that also was the cause of racism against Africans later. This is what we are going to reveal in this video. So bring your coffee and let's start. Before we show that all the racism and human suffering across centuries was caused by this story, we need to understand first what did Ham really do to his father while he was sleeping naked? What was the huge sin that caused the suffering and pain for millions throughout history? Let's look at all the religious sources that we found one by one. First, this book. It is a handbook on Genesis by William D. Rayburn, United Bible Society. It says that the context makes clear that the expression refers to incest or having sexual relations with a person. Mm. Is that enough though to make one third of humanity slaves forever to Sam? Nah, I think we need more information. Let's read the GPS Torah commentary. It says that the rabbinic sources are divided on whether Ham castrated his father or committed sodomy. So he either cut the testicles of his father while he was sleeping naked or committed sodomy with him. I know a lot of you can't believe they make that claim about a prophet of God, but what can we do? Let's read more sources. According to Rabbi Rashi, some say they castrated him and some say he sodomized him. According to Rabbi Hamik, Ham played with his father while he was sleeping naked. I think we know what he means by played. That is in addition to castration. According to Rabbi Seftei, 
it is sodomy and castration, both of them. And according to Rabbi Radak, it is castration. Let's say for now that this story is true. Let's assume for the sake of conversation that it happened. Assuming that Noah is a prophet, i.e. a man who is taught directly by God himself, he should at least know what is fair judgment, right? Maybe I'm wrong, but in my humble opinion, the fair punishment should be applied to Ham himself, not to all of his offspring until the end of time. Correct me if I'm wrong. The issue with this claimed scripture is it introduces a new concept that humanity never heard of before. It introduces for the first time the idea that a newborn baby should be treated according to his family tree instead of being treated according to his own life decisions and moralities. The idea of carrying the sin of the father. Noah now divided all humanity into three classes. Number one, the children of Ham, who includes the Canaanites and mainly modern day Middle Easterns and Africans. Those are the lowest class citizens, the cursed people forever, who should be slaves to the children of Sam. Remember, especially Sam, right? We will talk about that later. Number two, the children of Yafith, who include modern day Europeans and by extension the Americans. Those are second class people, who are not slaves like the children of Ham, but also they are not the owners of everything as they will expand and live, but they will live in the homes owned by the children of Sam. Number three, the children of Sam, who own everything, the chosen people, who own the houses of the free children of Yafith and own the slaves who are the children of Ham. That is Genesis 9:24-27. Let's assume that Ham and all of his descendants should be slaves forever. Let's assume that newborn babies who didn't commit any sin will be born slaves because of what Ham did thousands of years ago. The question is, why is the superiority of the Samites over the children of Yafet? Both of them didn't rape their father. Both of them looked away when he was naked. Why the Samites? And did this whole story even happen? Or was it written by the Samites themselves to claim superiority over humanity? Or was it originally written to pave the way for the Israelites to steal the Canaanites and later evolved into racial superiority over all humanity? According to the Handbook on Genesis by William D. Rayburn, United Bible Society. Others suggest that the purpose of these verses is to lay the groundwork for the later conflict between the descendants of Sam, the Israelites, and the descendants of Canaan, the Canaanites, in taking the promised land. Did they use this story as an excuse for genocide later? Or did they write this story during their genocidal campaigns and claim it was written in the past because that was their strategy in war from the beginning. That isn't only a product of the present. If you don't believe it, read these examples with me. 1 Samuel 15, 3 Listen now to the message from who, from who, from the Lord. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Until this part, it kinda makes sense. Read the rest of it. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Imagine people believing that these are the commands of God himself. Imagine people believing that God commands the genocide of infants, even the animals. Another example. Numbers 31, 14 to 18. Moses was angry with the officers of the army. How you allowed all women to live? He asked them. Now kill all the boys. Kill every woman who slept with a man. But save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Is that really Moses speaking? 
Because to me, it doesn't sound like the words of a prophet of God. It sounds more like the words of someone like the prime minister of the apartheid state. Sounds to me that it was attributed to Moses later to stop people from condemning their evil ethnic cleansing. The problem is the only source of these claimed scriptures are from within the same group itself. How do you know whether it's real or fabricated? They are the only source. Or maybe I'm wrong. Write me what you think in the comments below. After the author wrote the story to give superiority to the Samites over humanity, he had some obstacles to his plan. Turns out that there are other people who are Samites too, and they were not intended to be superior. According to Genesis 10, the children of Sam happened to include the Israelites, the Arameans, the Assyrians, and, listen, the Arabs. Oops, the plan failed. The purpose of the whole story is to give superiority, commanded by God himself, only to one of them. Well, the Arameans and the Assyrians are not an issue anymore, but the huge problem is the Arabs. What are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna fix this huge issue? We need to find a way to get rid of the Arabs so the chosen people who should own everything and rule humanity would be only part of the Samites, not all of them. We need to write another story, in the same claimed scripture, to further prove that God himself chose only this specific race to be superior than any other race. And of course, the race happened to be the same race as the author. Just a coincidence, wink wink. And that leads us to the second story. The story of Abraham and his two sons. One of the two sons was saved by God himself with a great sacrifice. The author found a way to replace the two brothers in this story. Isaac instead of Ishmael. I already showed evidence of that replacement, I don't want to repeat myself here, so if you missed it, I will leave a link to it in the description, go and check it after this video. But anyway, even after the author switching the two brothers, there is still the issue of inheritance. So the author made another claim, that because the mother of Ishmael was not a free woman, that means that Ishmael should not inherit the blessing from his father and all the inheritance should only go to Isaac. Israel himself, Jacob, he had 12 sons. A lot of them are from concubines, not from free women, and all of his sons inherited. So according to them, the contradiction is, Ishmael can't inherit because he is a son of a concubine. But the children of Israel can inherit even though they are also children of concubines. Mm. To be honest, the author didn't put much effort into this part of the story. He could have written a better story if he thought about it more. But you know what? It worked. It fooled a lot of people. You can even find tales of the same claim of racial superiority even in the New Testament. Yes, the New Testament, the Jesus is loved one. After Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, the New Testament claims that when a Canaanite woman came to Jesus to ask him for help, Jesus replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. He called her a dog. And you know what? She agreed. She said, yes, it is. Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Basically, Canaanites are dogs, even in the New Testament. They are human animals, even according to Jesus himself. And before you tell me, no, that is your interpretation, Jesus is love and all of this nonsense, let's read the commentary from Oregon, the famous 3rd century Christian scholar, who is an authority more than you. The Canaanite woman, therefore, because of her race, was not worthy even to receive an answer from Jesus himself. 
and acknowledges that the masters are from a nobler race. You can pause the video if you want to read it. Okay, you might think that the idea of a newborn baby starting his life with either a blessing or a curse stopped at being an excuse for genocide. But unfortunately not. Later after that, you had the idea that if you were born to a Jewish family, you should follow the law and you should be circumcised. But if you were born to a Gentile family, you shouldn't. That is according to Paul, of course. Also the idea that a newborn baby suffers the curse of the sin of Adam that he didn't commit and he needs somehow a human sacrifice to forgive the sin that he didn't do. It didn't stop there. You wish, as you can see in the William Davinson Talmud, Ham, the cursed one, was afflicted in that his skin turned black. Focus here. His skin turned black. That makes all his black descendants automatically slaves. This is how the idea went even further to the enslavement of the black descendants of Ham without remorse taking whoever doesn't die of them on their way to be forced labor. You can also find that in the Bereshit Rabbah. According to Rabbi Huna, your seed will be ugly and dark-skinned. See how it is all related now? If you want more information on this, you can read this article from Noah's Curse to Slavery's Rational. Read until you reach this part. By the 19th century, Many historians agree that the belief that African Americans were descendants of Ham was the primary justification for slavery among Southern Christians. It didn't stop here. You wish. Going further, the story in Matthew 27 was used by churches all over history to persecute innocent Jewish people, throw them into ghettos and even worse. Especially Matthew 27, 25. Read with me. That is when Jesus was being crucified. And the whole people said in reply, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Again this idea that our future children, who have not been born yet, should suffer the consequences of our actions because they belong to our race. Do you know what is the irony? The irony is the same people who fabricated this whole racist theology ended up being persecuted because of it. Well, until they somehow convinced the same Christians to switch their belief one more time and to declare them as God's chosen ones. And that if they somehow help them commit more genocide, Jesus will come and send them to heaven. And it worked. I'm always amazed by the brainwashing skills. It's not only about changing your own religion, no, it is also about changing other people's religion too. And convince them that God wants them to help you achieve whatever you want to achieve. That is really impressive. I pray to God that someday Christians will wake up and ask themselves, who wrote these books that they consider holy? And are these people trustworthy? Are these the people that they trust enough to learn about God from? Does it really make sense to believe that God is a racist God who belongs only to one group of people who would approve anything they do? Anyway, fast forward to today, we somehow went back to the original problem, the Canaanites. Mm, not the Canaanites themselves, the grand-grand-grand-grandchildren of the Canaanites. They are now called human animals once again, and they now don't have the right to live. Centuries of racism, centuries of death, centuries of tears, and centuries of human suffering. All of that because of one book. And that leads us to our final chapter, the end of racism. Thank God, he sent us another revelation through our beloved prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, to correct what they corrupted. Read with me. 
لا فضل لعربي على أعجمي ولا لأعجمي على عربي ولا لأحمر على أسود ولا لأسود على أحمر إلا بالتقوى There is no superiority for an Arab over an Arab for a non-Arab over an Arab for a white man over a black man for a black man over a white man Everyone is equal except with righteousness Quran 49.13 يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنسى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير Oh humanity, indeed I created you from male and female and made you into peoples and tribes so you may get to know each other. Surely, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous among you. Allah is truly all-knowing, all-aware. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him saw two people fighting for their tribes, fighting over whose family is more honorable. The Prophet immediately condemned them, saying, Are you still in arrogance? Leave the arrogance. It is rotten. Listen to this. The sin of thinking that your brother is lower than you is enough to ruin your hereafter. Another day, the Prophet heard one of his disciples saying to a black man, You are the son of a black woman. The Prophet immediately stopped him and condemned his action and told him, You still have the ignorance of the Arabs before Islam. That is not the moralities of the Muslims. And finally he said, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ دَعَى إِلَىٰ عَصَبِيَّةِ أَوْ قَاتَلْ مِنْ أَجْلِ عَصَبِيَّةِ أَوْ مَاتَ مِنْ أَجْلِ عَصَبِيَّةِ He is not one of the Muslims, the one who spread racism or tribalism. He is not one of the Muslims, the one who fought for racism or tribalism. He is not one of the Muslims, the one who died for racism or tribalism. And regarding God promising honor or land or victory to a specific group of people, yes, the Quran has promises like that. But there is a difference. Let's read it to understand the difference. يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن تنصروا الله ينصركم ويثبت أقدامكم Allah will grant victory to those who choose to stand up and strive to follow the commands of Allah. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبِدِ الْقَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ But if you turn away from the obedience of Allah, He will replace you with other people, and they will not be like you. See how God's promise is for the righteous, not for a specific family or a race. Anyone from any color from any family, from any race, if he becomes righteous, he can claim the reward from Allah. And if he turns away, then no reward for him. God is not racist. God judges our deeds, not our lineage. There are zero promises in the Quran for a specific group. For example, there is no promises for the Arabs. On the contrary, there are a lot of promises for whoever strives against himself to follow the straight path of Allah. Let me ask you a question. Which book is from God and which book is written by genocidal maniacs? Thank God he saved us from our ignorance and from the corruption they made. If you want to know exactly how Islam ended racism and ended slavery, check out our video Slavery in Islam. I will leave a link to it also in the description below. And before I go, I want to ask you a favor. This video has enough keywords that will either make it shadow banned or will shadow ban the whole channel. The only way this video will reach people who really need to see it is by you spreading it. If you care about spreading the truth, help it spread first by engaging with it, a like, a comment, and then share it with your friends on all of your social media. Thanks. And salam.